Why, hello and welcome back. You were listening to Joygasm, a video game and movie podcast. I'm Russ, Xbox Live Toaster 360, the brother from the same mother, Steve, Xbox Live Steve is also with me and CD Project Red is trying to make things right in episode 209 today January 22nd 2021 we have uh, actually quite a few things to talk about on today's episode gaming news is going to take up the lion's share with uh, news about a Star Wars license update. Indiana Jones game development, Arcane Studios working on a new IP, and Microsoft increasing the cost of Xbox Live Gold. Our topic of the day is CD Projekt Red Roadmap to Redemption, which you can fast forward to if you look at the timestamps located in your podcast provider detailed section below. But as for right now, it's time to just uh, have a little howdy duty time with you, Steve. What have you been up to this past week? What have you been watching? What have you been playing? Well, Russ, it's been nothing but Crash Nitro Racing five days a week. Really? Or five days this week, I should say. Five days a week. And is it you just <laughs> passively watching your wife play, or is it the two of you play? It's the two of us, Russ. It's mono y mono. Oh. But it's mostly her, I should say. She is definitely better at the game than I am. Nothing like uh, some good old-fashioned competition there for you, Steve. Right. Uh, I have... Pl- I have past a, a couple of the, the tracks, but she has done most of the leg work. As she now. <laughs> yes. I tell you, though, um, I do have some com- complaints about the game, but one of them definitely is not the track design. Russ, the track designs are... Pretty solid, huh? Pretty solid. There, there are quite a few tracks, and they are all very splendid Indeed. It's just very col- colorful, imaginative. Uh, I just can't say enough about it. Well, that's good, Steve. I, I may have to pick it up myself because yeah. I am a fan of that genre, having both Mario Kart and uh, Team Sonic Racing. I uh, yeah. may have to uh, complete the trifecta of Mario, or Mario, trifecta of kart racing. Right. And uh, let's see. So other than that, though, what we've been doing is uh, eating dinner while watching The Sopranos, Russ. Oh, man. Gotta do it. You gotta do it. Oh, man. Here we go again. Do I still have my season two over here? I have no idea. Steve, it's a good question. You, uh, you, I believe last time we talked about this, you said that you had taken back your season one. Is that mm. true? Am I, am I remembering that? Uh, I don't, am I recalling that conversation correctly, Steve? I don't think I did. Well, I'll have to take we a can, peek. We can take us. a peek. Well, I mean, you can keep it the season one, Russ. I mean, you can, you can have it here. I want you to watch it. Well, I'm trying, Steve. You're but not the, trying hard the enough. The discs are a little damaged. So uh, it's a little difficult to watch when the episodes themselves uh, are corrupted. <laughs> I don't even know because the, the discs are fine. It's just like the way they were written or something because you look at the discs. They're not smudged. You abused them They're not minute. cracked. They're not anything. You probably spilled some lasagna or spaghetti <laughs> on it while you're Oops. watching one of the other DVD episodes. I hope that didn't ruin anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting sauce. there watching the kind of acidic. The intro freezes. <laughs> like okay, how, 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 how you doing? Hiya, 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 doing? How you doing? Doing, 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 doing. I don't think this is how it's supposed to be. <laughs> forget about, it, forget, it, for, 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 forget about it. Whoa, it's the forget remix. Forget about it. Forget about it. <laughs> forget it. How you do it? Forget it. How you do it? Forget it. <laughs> it keeps jumping back and forth between these two scenes. I'm getting confused at the story here. <laughs> <laughs> I keep expecting him to tell me to forget about it, but then he goes right into asking me how I'm doing. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused here. <sighs> oh, boy. It is good, though, Russ. And plus, you can watch it on HBO Max. 
Oh, I did not know that. That's how I'm. That's how we're watching it. Well, then I will probably do it that way, just because I've gone through a no number excuses. of your DVDs and uh, no excuses. You run into the same problem, Steve. <sighs> no excuses. What else you been doing there? Huh? You know, that's almost pretty much it. Ross. Final we Fantasy had... progress at all? Oh, well, no, I played a little bit. I actually let's see. What did I say last time? I went home and played more of it. I actually passed the. Part that I was I was stuck on. Did some uh, other stuff in the meantime. No, got a little stronger. You know, one thing I miss is the random battles. You can just kind of wander around and get into trouble and and just start beating on baddies. And now you they have you have to actually like continue the story. And there's only so many baddies you can beat, and you can't just keep on doing it. You have to progress in the story. Mm. Rather than as before, like, oh, I could just wander outside of town and just, just and, and getting countless fights. Now, is that true even when you were in the Midgar portion of the original Final Fantasy 7? Or was was that kind of more once you left Midgar? Than no, it was definitely... I mean, if, if you were not in a like... Not in like a little town or, mm. or part of the slums. Like mm. if you were continuing to go through the mission, uh-huh. you would get into random encounters wherever you were. Not the not the not the the village. So if you wandered around like and you wanted to go shopping for armor, or you want to go shopping for a sword, or you were visiting some character, like yeah, and of course that there would be no enemies there. But once you got outside and were just maybe going to a different spot on the map or you were inside Shinra or you were, you know, whatever. Yes. You would constantly get into random encounters. Mm -hmm. So now that's not a thing. And I miss it because I wanted to get a little stronger before I continued the game and there was no way to do it. I mean, I had to wander around quite a bit before I found like specific areas where there were baddies. Okay. And then I would leave and have to come back. And then I would leave further because they weren't there. And I'd and I'd have to go back into town and then go back out of town so the whole all the enemies could respawn again. There was only like four of them. I'm like, great, this is a time suck. So <laughs> anyhow, uh, I missed that with the um, with the new game. Well, maybe they'll start to include that in the the subsequent huh. p- parts of the game. Yeah. You never you never know, Steve. Whenever that's going to be. That's true. Whenever it's going to be. Hopefully it won't be too long, though. Hopefully <laughs> yeah. it'll be within, like, I don't know, a uh, couple years, maybe? Yeah, a couple years. Oh, thank goodness. Only a couple years. <laughs> <laughs> now they give us a taste, and they expect us to wait. Indeed. <clears throat> but Indeed, Steve. I hate to be short, Russ, but you know what? That's all I've been really doing. It's just been uh, Soprano. It was a little bit of Final Fantasy, and mostly Crash. Well, at least you got a whole healthy dose of crash. But I will say I did watch the first two episodes of uh, WandaVision. Excellent. Yes. And uh, I will take this opportunity to be able to say that we have decided we're going to hold off on doing like a, a topic of the day for WandaVision until we've actually seen the entire season. Because yeah. as it currently stands, Not there much are... Talk about, there, well, there's no... And, and I mean, we could talk a little bit about it uh, here yeah. and there, but um, there's only two episodes that have dropped as of this mm-hmm. recording. Mm-hmm. Technically, the third one did drop today, mm-hmm. but neither one of us has viewed that particular episode. Right. Been at work all day. Been at work all day, exactly. Um, but have you seen the first two episodes or just the first yeah. episode? First two episodes. What, what do you think of of your, like, just a first impression? Well, I'm bored, Russ. You're bored, I Steve. am bored, guys. I mean, we watch the Marvel logo and they hear the song. I'm like, yeah, let's go. Vision rocks. And then it's Love this- you, Wanda! <laughs> yeah, love you, Wanda! <laughs> um... <laughs> <laughs> Will you take me? <laughs> <laughs> Give me a smooch. <laughs> and it's, of course, it's like this old, old black and white sitcom with like the cheesy humor. And you think, okay, something's going to happen. I'm waiting for it. And then, I, and, and it never really kind of does. So you're like, where are they going with this? Like something cool I would have expected ha- to have happened yes. by now. Yes. And it's not happening. Yes. And I haven't done a whole lot of research on the show. Like, this is only what we're going to get. But I like the character of Vision. I want to see some Vision action. Mm. 
Uh, and, it, and it just kind of makes me wonder, like, where where are they going? Like, are we going to expect the same thing with, like, the Winter sh- Soldier and the Falcon? <gasps> the Winter Shoulder? The, 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 the cold I, I would, shoulder? I should totally make, like, a, a funny movie poster. <laughs> yeah, sh- that it looks like a, like a really cool shoulder. It's like the Winter Shoulder. <laughs> what? With Sean Connery's voice. <laughs> yes, the Winter Shoulder. Like the, the soldier or the shoulder? I don't know. He's giving me the cold shoulder. Yeah. <gasps> yeah. <gasps> anyway, <laughs> so. Yeah, don't play lean on me when you're around the cold shoulder. I mean, I don't really, I, I don't know. Or the this, winter shoulder, sorry. Yeah, okay, I'll stop. Well, anyway, I'll continue. <laughs> I don't know if this was a comic, like it was some like cheesy romance comic between Vision and Wanda, which I don't really think would make sense. I mean, maybe they did have it out or it was just, this is a Disney original kind of thing. But I, if it is an original kind of thing and it doesn't go anywhere from this, I got to wonder why. Mm-hmm. Why would you do this? Mm-hmm. After after Endgame and killing off Vision and now everything, I mean, you're, you're, you're going to leave us with this. I don't know. It just doesn't make sense. All right, the, the show still has got more episodes, Russ. We still got to watch it. Maybe something cool is going to happen. I'm leaving the door open. I'm not closing it yet. But um, I just got to wonder why. I got to wonder what's going on. <clears throat> well, and you are not alone in that just because I, uh, too, am wondering where this is headed. However, I do recall when we were looking at some of the, the details of the upcoming show, it was intentionally designed to be more of this kind of off-the-wall, quirky... Um, I'm not even sure. It's it's not even really, it's kind of a sitcom, but not. But it's not even funny. Well, I think it is, it is a reflection of that particular time period of TV. Right. So you have that, which I think has some elements of like, like, you know, the, 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 you know, leave it to beaver or I love Lucy mm-hmm. type of, of, of uh, humor and that sort of thing. But it is interesting that they're going through having that type of, of um, approach to how the, the, the show gets started. But I recall that like, I think they're going to kind of go through different kinds of, I'm trying to remember exactly what they said. It was something along the lines of like how, they wanted to look at the the entire spectrum of the evolution of television. And so they started out kind of in the black and white days Mm. and then moved their way into like the sixties and the seventies and the eighties and that sort of thing. Okay. And then in terms of the plot, like apparently it's, it's not designed solely to be like an old school sitcom. Actually there's kind of a method to it where like they find themselves in this situation and, and then, um, like if you notice, there are moments in both episodes where some really weird stuff happens mm-hmm. that causes them to kind of question what is happening, what's going on. They're Did not ex- take the blue pill or the red pill. Exactly. So I think we are going to be shown over time what is actually going on. And I think they are going to be using the show as kind of a conduit into the, the MCU. Oh, uh, in terms of how they're going to move forward into phase four and phase five mm. and so on and so forth, just because um, I think it, it has a lot to do with the Scarlet Witch in terms of her abilities and that sort of thing. So I, I mean, I think I'll just segue into what's new with me because I too watched it. Um, I think it's actually, it's a, it's a very original take on what you can do with those characters. I was very happy to see both vision and Wanda oh, sure. uh, together like that. And especially being in that type of uh, setting and environment. One of the things that I thought was um, kind of coming to mind as I watched it was uh, how innocent and positive those old shows were in terms of whatever were kind of uh, subject matter they, they were going through on an, on an episodic basis but also to you definitely had a certain type of uh, humor and wit back in the day that was very exclusive to that time period. And so it was fun to be able to see their, their own kind of spin on that and pay homage to that as they move forward into it. However, I am very curious to see what those other scenes, like you, you see these brief scenes of, of actual color where it's like, it's, it's present day 
And it looks as though someone is trying to communicate or get in touch with Vision and Wanda. We don't know who that is. So it remains to be seen on that. So I think there is um, a, a there, there's an intentional approach to what you were talking about with, with how you're like, well, it's not like totally funny and it's not like da da da. It's like, I think that they are intentionally injecting that to make it so that something is awry. Something is not exactly as it seems, but they don't want to like hit us over the head yet with it. They're, they're doling it out. So one can only hope one can only hope I ended up watching birds of prey and oh, the fantabulous boy. emancipation of one Harley Quinn through HBO max, Steve. And let me tell you, I want my two hours back. Mm, I can imagine. I, okay. Uh, the only reason why I wanted to watch it is because I'm a big fan of Margot Robbie. And yeah. I also think that she's uh, a fantastic, uh, Harley Quinn. However, this movie, my goodness, it was awful. It Pretty was terrible. so bad that not even Harley or Harley, not even Margot could uh, could save this. Um, what a mess of a movie! I think the the casting choices were just terrible. When I saw um, Huntress up there, it, it is not at all how I, how I envisioned Huntress to be, or even in the comic books. You look at the comic books and you and you see what, what Huntress is like. Um, the same can be said for Black Canary. Um, again, it, it, it's it's just you have the this uh, very petite girl playing Black Canary. It's not at all like like how she uh, looks in the comic books. Um, oh my goodness! I mean, even another DC failure. Well, and it's weird because like <laughs> like you know, friends, Ewan McGregor is, he plays Black Mask in uh, the movie as well. We both are big fans of Ewan McGregor, you know. But my goodness, what a terrible casting choice for Black Mask. He he was not intimidating to me at all. And uh, I'm just I'm, now okay, okay. Since we're talking about characters. The person who was actually um, cast to play Zaz, because Zaz is in the movie. Do, are you familiar with who Zaz is? I don't know enough about Zaz. So Zaz is, uh, he's one of the lesser known villains. Um, he was played by Chris Messina, and he did a really nice job. Like he's, um, to give you a quick little overview of, of, of Zaz. Zaz is one of those uh, type of Arkham Asylum patients. He um, uh, he loves to, to kill people using a knife and every person he kills, he like actually uh, creates a, a cut on himself. So like if you look at his body, he has all kinds of scars all along his body. Basically, like if you think of like, you know, oh, but, but I put another notch on my belt. It's kind of like that, except he does it to his own body. So you see like, you know, like kind of like the the one, two, three, four, five like the tallies. The t- yeah, it's it's like a tally kind of thing, um, but it's it's done through those lines. Um, again, he's not one of the the main or major villains, but the way that Chris um, portrayed Victor's as he actually was really good. I, I was I was like, okay, that that was the the, the silver lining for uh, the rest of the cast. But my goodness, the way I mean, the story really was not executed well. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm just sitting there. I'm thinking, oh, surely it's going to get a little, I mean, it really wasn't. I mean, it was just like, wow, you guys, how much did you spend on this? This is, this is disappointing. Yeah. <laughs> That's really how it seemed with the preview. I, and I hate to judge a book by the cover, but I saw the preview and I thought, if this is how you're going to try and sell it to me, you ain't selling it. And so I, I didn't even want to waste time on it. Yeah. I remember we were contemplating whether or not we should go see it in the theater or not. And, and I'm just, I'm glad I didn't spend money on it. Cause I'm just like, my goodness, like this is, this is really bad. Do not recommend that one. Um, I would say, you, uh, you know, to give you an idea, like, I mean, suicide squad, I felt had more value than, uh, than birds of prey. I'm just like, Oh, Okay, that was a that was a, a cool idea to be made into a movie, and the way you guys approached the, the subject material, I was like, nope, sorry. Having said that, 
I have also been putting an enormous amount of time into Cyberpunk 2077. No, really? Both on the PC as well as Xbox Series X. Really? One of the things about Xbox Series X is I have intentionally been avoiding a lot of the main, well, actually all of the main quest um, storylines um, as well as the side quests. And instead, I've actually been just, just been going around and taking on all of the uh, the NCPD calls as well as like the random uh, uh, crimes in progress um, just in, in an attempt to help to bolster up my my level and my street cred and that sort of thing. And the idea is, is that I want to be able to wait on playing the game fully in the Xbox Series X until they actually have the upgrade, that which we'll, we'll get to during our topic of the day. But it's been a lot of fun to be able to take the time looking into more of the things that I overlooked initially, like the whole crafting thing, for instance. Dude, you can you can not only craft weapons, you can craft clothing. Hell you, can, yeah. you can craft um, cyberware. <sighs> There's a lot of things you can do in there that I was unaware of. I figured, oh, it's mostly like a, kind of just a, a crafting weapons thing, right? Like, no, like you you can actually pretty much craft and upgrade. Remember. If there's a certain type of weapon or, mm. or piece of clothing you like or something yeah. like that, and you want to keep it legit as you level up, because mm. its stat stays the same when you when you discover it, right? When you pick it up. Well, you can upgrade that too. You can upgrade the stats so that way it stays legit as you move on, which I think is a it's a great idea. It's a great idea. Great idea, Steve. So it's been a lot of fun going into that. I don't even know how many hours I have into it now, Steve. Probably about 300. I would say so. It's probably at least 300, if not more. Um, I was going to check to see, I, I actually have no idea how many hours I have put into the Xbox series X version. Uh, but I, but I am confident that I probably have at least 300 hours into the PC. Mm. Yes, indeed. Do you know, Russ, my wife actually brought something to my attention. Nothing to do with that though. Oh, did she not? <laughs> she said <laughs> after we watched Tenet and we came home from the podcast, this like, well, like, a, like a day later, she goes, Hey, and I said, yeah. And that was basically it. But then she went on to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> she says, hey, um, you like Denzel Washington. And I said, yeah. And she says, did you on the show say that John David Washington was, is, used to be, still is, Denzel's son? Who? Denzel Washington is the father of John David Washington. Oh my goodness. From Tenant. I had no idea. I didn't know that either. I thought, I mean, yeah, Washington, why? I mean, there's tons of people with last name Washington. Who would have thunk? But um, my college roommate had the last name Washington. There you go. Hey, he's related. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyhow, I thought that was awesome. That is really cool. I had no idea either. So I guess what happened was uh, John David. Washington, J.D. Dub, mm -hmm. gave a little shout out to his dad on some like media, you know, interview sort of thing. And at the same time, Denzel was getting interviewed by somebody else. And they said, oh, hey, by the way, Denzel, you know, your son gave you a shout out. And he's going, uh, when, what? No, what, what do you say? And so anyway, my wife saw both and she's like, hey, I thought you like, I should let you know. Well, I thought that was pretty awesome. I have to track this guy's career. Yeah. And, um. Uh, See some more stuff that he's in. Kudos to the wife for a little nugget of info like that. Yeah. Stuff. Very, very nice indeed. I'm trying to think of what else I was doing. Sorry, I kind of broadsided you. You tend to do that, Steve. That's okay. I love you anyway. That's why I jumped from one side of the room and then just cracked right into your ribs and... <laughs> The, I think the only other thing I can think of is that we played Overwatch yes. uh, for our Wednesday night stream. Yes. And we noticed that there was a, an, at least one new level that we had not seen before. There may have been yeah. two, actually. Hmm. Um, so that was great. And I think uh, I would say we were probably 50-50. That seems to be the case. 60-40. We, we, we started out strong and then started to peter off as the algorithm decided to get, give us more uh, accomplished uh tough players out there. Indeed. However, I'm not going to complain about that just because we had Capture the Flag and that makes me a very happy person. That's right. I really love me some Capture the Flag, especially in Overwatch. Wow. 
Well, let's get into some gaming news. What do you say, Husty? That's right. We have actually quite a few things to talk about here. Do we? Uh, a lot of which has to do with Star Wars. Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order updated for next-gen consoles. This has me very excited because I was a big fan of this game. Did you ever... You beat the game. Yes, I did. Excellent. Proud of you, Steve. While it's not a next-gen version of the game, it doesn't add features or new tech. The patch does allow the PS4 and Xbox One versions of Fallen Order to make use of the significantly more powerful new console hardware of the PS5 and the Xbox Series X. The next-gen optimization update improves Fallen Order's frame rate, dynamic resolution ranges, and post-processing resolution. Oh, man. Although the changes do depend on what hardware you you are running. For the Xbox Series S, (laughs) the only change is the frame rate, which has been increased from 45 to 60 frames per second. Yeah. On Xbox Series X, performance mode now hits 60 frames per second, and the dynamic resolution Mm. can scale between 1080p and 1440p. Ooh, that's a sweet spot, man. On normal mode, post-processing has been increased to 4K resolution. And the dynamic resolution can uh, range between the 1512p and 2160p. Over on the the PlayStation 5, the frame rate has been increased from 45 to 60 frames per second. Unlike the Xbox version, there are no normal or performance modes. Instead, post-processing is set at 1440p and dynamic scaling has been disabled in favor of a locked render resolution of 1200p. Previously, the game scaled between 8 10p and 1080p so you, you're definitely getting a, a, a bump on both consoles in that regard that has me very excited because i was waiting for them to give a proper upgrade to that game before i started new game plus because if you recall there is a new game plus mode i recall that they support that makes me a very happy man steve and see i bought i believe i bought it for ps5 i don't think i have it on xbox one ah but uh, regardless, at least I will be able to enjoy some of the goodies on there. I may end up just picking it up on Xbox Series X just because of, of the other goodies as well. I, I haven't made my, my mind up on that. Well, let's just buy it. Let's keep it on one system. Why don't you pocket it? It could cash. actually find its way onto Game Pass, I would imagine. Eventually. It's already on Game Pass, Rose. Is it really on Yes, Game it Pass? is. I had no idea. I'm glad you... See, that's why I keep you around, Steve. Uh, are you Are you sure? You're 100% I sure? I am sure. Yes. Game Pass it is. I get all my 15 bucks worth of Game Pass per month. You better believe it. In other Star Wars news, Star Wars games are going to be branded under a Lucasfilm Games banner. <laughs> so if you recall, it used to be back in the heyday that it was called LucasArts. Oh, well, yeah. Then, of course, they... Uh, unfortunately shut that thing down right. and kind of it's been in this weird kind of state but games will now be brought together under a single banner called Lucasfilm Games announced on StarWars.com the company revealed that Lucasfilm Games is now the official identity for all gaming titles from Lucasfilm a name that encompasses the company's rich catalog of video games and its eye toward the future now yeah. you're probably wondering I'm not well I am Steve as many of our listeners out there One of the things that um, people are asking about is, okay, well, well, that is nice in terms of a rebranding, but what else is there in terms of how these Star Wars games will be released? Well, first of all, you have an open world Star Wars game in development at Ubisoft. (laughs) This is not EA. This is Ubisoft. It's Ubisoft. Ubisoft is working on a story-driven open world Star Wars game with the Lucasfilm Games brand. The division developer Ubisoft Massive will develop the new game, according to Ubisoft CEO. Uh, It marks the start of a long-term collaboration with Disney. No other gameplay details have been announced, and Massive is actively recruiting for the project. The game will utilize the Snowdrop engine used for the studio's Division Games, and Division 2 director uh, will direct this project as well. No indication has been given as to whether the massive Star Wars game would be single or multiplayer, what part of the Star Wars timeline it would be a part of, or when it might be released. The only thing we all know is that it's in a galaxy far, far away. There you go. There you go. 
I have not actually played Division, despite the fact that I've bought both Division 1 and 2, but I have heard from friends that, that there is quite a bit to like about those games, so it, it um, at least is a good start knowing that you know, whatever, whatever they're working on now, uh, it will pique my curiosity. And so I, I hope uh, they're able to, to make something amazing with that. Uh, however, that is not the only story it, with regards to Lucasfilm games. Indiana Jones game is coming from Bethesda and, of course, Lucasfilm games. Machine Games, Steve. Are, do you remember who Machine Games is? They're the ones who made Wolfenstein the New Order and Wolfenstein the New Colossus, one of my favorite first-person shooters. Ah. Well, they and Bethesda are partnering with Lucasfilm Games on a standalone Indiana Jones game to be executively produced by Bethesda Game Studios director Todd Howard. Todd Howard. Bethesda tweeted to say, quote, a new Indiana Jones game with an original story is in development from our studio at Machine Games and will be executive produced by Todd Howard in collaboration with Lucasfilm Games. It will be some time before we have more to reveal, but we are very excited to share today's news, end quote. Aside from the company's logo, the game will seemingly revolve in part around Vatican City with a plane ticket to Rome dated for October 1937. And as IGN's Jordan Ullman points out, a map including the Sistine Chapel uh, spread um, out on the desk. So little, little, little hints, little clues as to what we can expect. No release date, genre, or platforms have been given at time of writing, but one thing is clear that Machine Games will have plenty of ideas for how Indy can dispatch of the Nazis because Machine Games, as you know, Steve, they're pretty, uh, pretty pretty good experts in the uh, way of dispatchment of said Nazis given the uh, Wolfenstein New Colossus yeah, games. Yeah, but Indiana Jones is kind of a family name, right? Well, I don't think they're going to be going quite as far as they did with yeah, uh, Wolfenstein. No one's Wolfenstein. getting their head cut off, Rush. No, but at least, I don't know, I I am looking forward to that. I think that they th th there's a lot going on there, and hopefully uh, it turns out to be amazing. Now, you're probably also wondering just what EA has to say about all this, because if you recall, EA used to have a sweet little exclusive deal where only they were the ones making Star Wars titles. Well, EA comments on the making of more Star Wars games after Lucasfilm Ubisoft partnership. They released a statement about its future with the Star Wars brand following today's news that Ubisoft will be working on a brand new Star Wars game with the newly formed Lucasfilm Games. Quote, we are proud of our long-standing collaboration with Lucasfilm Games, which will continue for years to come, EA said in a statement. They continued on saying, our talented teams have created some of the most successful games in the history of Star Wars franchise, including Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. In 2013, EA and Star Wars agreed in a multi-year deal, which gave EA the exclusive rights to publish core Star Wars video games developed by its internal studios. No comment has been given on how or when that deal was altered. Very interesting indeed. I will say that, you know, the Battlefront series, Battlefront 1 and 2, have been good. Star Wars Squadrons was good. Uh, and also the Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order by Respawn Entertainment. That was fantastic. So it has been a kind of a, 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 a turn for the better because... There were many years there where no Star Wars games were being released by EA and a lot of the gaming community were getting pretty vocal, if you recall, like, where are the Star Wars titles? Like, you have this amazing deal. What's going on? Not to mention, I think there were one or two titles in development that were Star Wars IPs that got, I guess, thrown in the trash or something. They got canceled. EA didn't know how to make enough money on microtransactions on them. Eh, well, toss that in a can. It's very bizarre. But hey, uh, I am curious to see how these new Star Wars games turn out. Also, one of the things that just entered my head, Steve, was my finger, is that Bethesda <laughs> Games is now owned by Microsoft. So That's right, Russ. Do you think the Indiana Jones game will be exclusive Most to Xbox? Most likely. Or, or do you think that they're going to do some sort of weird plan to try and make uh, money off the PlayStation platform? I don't know. They're, they just got... Well, it depends because... Remember when that whole deal happened? There, I think Bethesda was like, yeah, we got some other contracts we got to finish up first. This might be one of those contracts. It could be, Steve. It could be indeed. Yeah. We'll have to wait and see. 
My fedora and whip will be ready, though. Uh, Changing gears a bit over to Dishonored co-creator uh, Arcane Studios. They are working on a new game with the... Uh, yeah, well, basically... It, so Arcane Studios are responsible for creating the Dishonored franchise and Prey franchise. Spotted on Twitter... Uh, specifically by Twitter user Timur222, the LinkedIn profile of senior visual effects artist um, Lisa Shariri. I'm not even sure if I'm... I apologize if I'm <laughs> saying that last name incorrectly. But they explain that the company is working on an unannounced project in Unreal 4, and it's supposed to be some sort of fantasy title. Dishonored co-creator Harvey Smith is working on an unannounced game at Arcane Austin, alongside devs from the Dishonored and Prey team, speaking to Vandal and translated by IGN, Smith explained that he had moved back to Austin after completing Dishonored 2 at Arcane's Lions Studio and confirmed that he's not a part of the company's next game, but a separate unannounced project. Quote, I'm not on Deathloop. I'm on something else, working with the guys who made Dishonored and Prey, end quote. So whatever the game ends up being, It'll be part of the new era of Microsoft-owned Bethesda games, meaning it would be almost certainly launch into Game Pass and perhaps even be an Xbox exclusive. Hmm. Finally, the last story here, speaking of Microsoft, is that Microsoft is increasing the price of Xbox Live Gold. Have you heard about this, Steve? I have! According to Microsoft, this is taking place in order to evaluate the current value and pricing of the services provided. As a result, Live Gold is going to jump up in price. However, if you are an existing Live Gold 6-month or 12-month member, the price will continue to renew at the old price of $9.99 per month or $24.99 for every three months. For those who do not fall into this bracket, a one-month membership will now cost $10.99. Three months is now $29.99. And six months is $59.99 or the local market, excuse me, the local market equivalent. This means that the price of a one-month membership has increased by $1, while the price of three months has now $5 or more. So it is nice that they are grandfathering in all of their Xbox fan base that have been a part of it for some time. At the same time, though, I was reading a good article. It was an opinion piece by Ryan McCaffrey over at IGN. Sure. And he was really right on the money about his concern over how this structure works in the sense that it's essentially punishing new gamers to the Xbox ecosystem. Like... It's weird because for the longest time, Microsoft has done a fantastic job of making a lot of these these decisions that are very fair and empowering to the gamer. You know, like like the the very idea of Game Pass has benefited everyone who's been a part of it. It's been a really swell deal, to be honest. Not to mention the fact that when you when it comes to the Xbox Live Gold setup, in the past, if you wanted like a year long uh, membership, it was like sixty bucks. Which, I mean, that's that's a good, really good deal, especially considering a lot of the problems that, that Sony PlayStation had um, during the, the, the PlayStation 4. You know, you had lots of uh, hackings going on, lots of break-ins. Uh, sometimes the servers went down. So people could justify that cost when it came to Microsoft. Hopefully, it'll be a work in progress. Maybe they'll be able to continue refining it and making it a little more of a better deal for newcomers. We'll just have to wait and see. And that, Steve, is our gaming news for this week. Any parting comments? Thank you, Russ. You're a man of few words, <laughs> Steve. <laughs> Lay down in a tub of ice, it's time for the topic of the day. Topic of the day is the CD Projekt Red Roadmap 
to redemption. So there has been a number of big developments that have transpired over uh, last week. We were a little bit late in talking about this just because we had some movie reviews that we were doing over the past two weeks, but this is indeed worth hashing out and talking about here. So uh, we actually noticed that um, there was a video that got sent out and it was actually by the co-founder of CD Projekt Red. And it was it was kind of surprising because I don't think anybody really expected this kind of thing to happen. And um, they ended up sending this out. The, the title is called Cyberpunk 2077, Our Commitment to Quality. It's already been out a week and has received 2.3 million views. It's a five minute long video. I thought that we could play it here so all of you could be able to hear what he had to say and we can be able to, uh, you know, we'll pause it uh, intermittently here and there if we have comments that we'd like to make. But I do think it's worth checking out and uh, giving it at least uh, it a world to be able to kick things off. So let, let's let's tune in and see what- uh, Founder of the Project. He has when I started to the Project 25 years ago, one of its founding principles was honest and direct communication with gamers. Ah. When CD Projekt Red, the game development part of CD Projekt was born, it added something important to that principle, the ambition to make the best games in the world. It became our mission and something that guided us up until now. Based on that legacy of genuine and honest communication, you've trusted us and pre-ordered our game. And despite good reviews on PC, the console version of Cyberpunk 2077 did not meet the quality standard we wanted it to meet. I and the entire leadership team are deeply sorry for this, and this video is me publicly owning up to that. Good. Please, don't fault any of our teams for what happened. They all are incredibly talented <laughs> and hardworking. Oh, we know. Myself We're definitely and the faulting are you the for final it. decision makers, <laughs> and it was our call to release the game. Although, believe me, we never ever intended for anything like this to happen. I assure you that we'll do our best to regain your trust. Now I'd like to tell you how the situation looked like from the inside. Cyberpunk 2077 is huge in scope. And I'm not only talking about quests or things you see at first glance. I'm talking about a multitude of custom objects, interacting systems and mechanics. In the game, everything is not stretched out over flat terrain where we can make things less taxing hardware-wise, but condensed in one big city and in a relatively loading-free environment. On its own, this is a challenge, but we made it even more difficult for ourselves by wanting to make the game look epic on PCs and then adjusting it to consoles, especially old gems. So I'm going to pause it right there. So that one line proves that they were enamored with working on the PC version first, as opposed to the console versions. What's interesting to me about that is how, you know, the, the PC is, is such an open ended platform as opposed to the plug and play consoles. You know, if you're on a PS4, if you're on an Xbox one, you have hardware specs that are intentionally designed to, to cr basically create a performance cap. Like here are the specs. You have to create games within these guidelines in order for it to run, you know, say 30 frames per second or 60 frames per second. And, and there are technical certification requirements for every console that comes out. And you, as, as a gaming studio, you have to adhere to those requirements because it prevents games from having like, you know, horrible frame rates of like 10 frames per second or glitching or, um, you know, rubber banding, screen tearing, that sort of thing. And the, the kind of compromise, if you will, is that if you're on a PC, the PC will have higher resolution options. It will have higher texture resolutions. If you have a, 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 a PC that's that's capable of handling that level of performance. However, if you don't have a brand spanking new PC, you're going to run into frame rate drops. You're going to run into all this stuff, especially if you try and bump up the settings. So it's this give and take. So what I find interesting about that situation is, is that when they introduced Cyberpunk to us, it was marketed heavily as it being a console game. Right. So, you know, Back in 2013, when they debuted it, they debuted it at E3. 
like at I've, Microsoft's booth at Microsoft's press conference. And they were pushing the Xbox. It wasn't at a, a PC press conference or anything like that. It should come, however, as no surprise just because CD Projekt Red tends to develop for PC first. The Witcher was no exception. The Witcher came out on PC first, and then they um, uh, made a, a, a port over to the console, and even those games had bugs to a certain extent, and they, they ironed them out over time. They made good on uh, making it uh, just an absolutely terrific game. So anyway, figured I, I would interject real quick. Well, also, he's what he's saying, too, was is that, I mean, he, he's not coming out and saying that the game was released ahead of when it actually should be released. I mean, he was basically, he's acknowledging the problem, but he's not saying anything of, you know, we really wanted it. We, we gave you a deadline and we wanted to stick with that deadline since we had, we, we changed the deadline a couple times. We were, we just want to get the game out to you because we, I know you, we were, you were tired of waiting. He just says that, you know, okay, no, we're, 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 Commitment to quality. We're going to try to make things right with you, but um, nothing to the effect of like, well, we said that, but this is what we meant sort of thing. That was our core assumption. And things did not look super difficult at first. We knew the hardware gap, yes, but ultimately, I think that time has proven that uh, we've underestimated the task. To give you a concrete example and the main culprit, we had to constantly improve our in-game streaming system for all-gen consoles. Streaming is responsible for feeding the engine with what you see on screen, as well as the game mechanics. And since the city is so packed and the disk bandwidth of all-gens is what it is, it constantly challenged us. Now, what's interesting about him saying that is he's referring to the PS4 and the Xbox One as old-gen. What's interesting is that when they announced this game publicly, it was 2013, the Xbox One and the PS4 were just released in 2013, if you recall. So those were like the next gen systems when they announced this game. And then they spent the next, you know, seven years working on the game. And I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing they probably had some additional years of pre-production when they were in stealth mode as they worked on it. So it's interesting how these are some of the things that I don't really agree with him on where, where he, he's trying to make it sound like, oh, the, you know, the old gen just couldn't handle what we were doing. No, it could handle what was going on. I think what where they started was perfectly fine for the PS4 and Xbox One. But again, because they were focusing on PC, PC constantly is improving. Like you could buy an amazing rig and six months later, it no longer can can really perform at the level it, it did when it was first released. That's how rapidly um, all the hardware and different types of, of guts of, of any given PC change and, and evolve and improve over time. But also, um, before you hit play there, Russ. Uh, yes. I, if you remember, earlier, like almost this time last year, they were saying the game, they tweeted out, the game is done. The mm. game is done. We're just focusing on polishing it up. There's a few bugs that we got to iron out. So we want to take the extra time to do this for you. But the game is done. Night City is complete. Da, da, da. So they're, they're giving the consumer confidence of like, hey, we just want to give you a fantastic game. But everything like all the primary stuff that we have to do, it's all done. The game is done. Yeah. And we just want to take a little more time to perfect it. Not alpha mode. And he's going to talk, I think, a bit more about that here in just a minute. Every change and improvement needed to be tested. And as it turned out, our testing did not show a big part of the issues you experienced while playing the game. As we got closer to the final release, we saw significant improvements each and every day. And we really believed we would deliver in the final day zero update. Now let's talk about the review process. We started sending our PC review keys in the first days of December. On launch day, December 10th, we hit the ground running with a really good start on PC. Okay, so I'm going to pause it there again because he's now talking about when they were doing QA testing, how they weren't seeing anything, how things were working fine for them when they sent out the keys around December 10th or, or 8th, right around 8th and 10th, right around there. What's interesting, though, is that I had seen stuff um, on IGN where they discussed 
they were, um, you know, around that time period of December 8th and 10th, they only received gaming keys for the PC version. They did not receive at that point in time keys for the console versions of the game. That's why when the initial review came out, they only reviewed it for PC and they gave it a nine out of 10 versus the console review that came out a bit later where they gave it a four out of 10. But the main thing here that I think is interesting to capitalize on is he has gone from apologizing about what has transpired and, and the state of the game to now claiming that their internal QA department didn't see anything wrong with the game, that it was looking fine. I am sorry, but that is a lie. That is wrong because with the normal gamers out there playing the game after, even after the day one patch, you have people who are, who are downloading the game and playing it and everything else. You're not, you're not even trying to test the game. You're just trying to play the game and there are all kinds. I mean, you, you are a testament to this because you're playing on a base console. You're playing on the, on the Xbox one, correct? Yeah. And then, and then from the get go, I'm, you can notice that the game is not right. Yeah. I mean, you didn't, I didn't progress into the game and think, man, eh, this is some bugs here. Like within the first five minutes, I'm going, there's something wrong with my game. It's running extremely poor. Yeah. There, there's just an overwhelming amount of issues, whether it's gameplay issues, frame rate issues, visual fidelity, memory um, loading issues. I mean, like, yeah, it, he's, he's not being honest in this particular instance of the, the, the video, which is unfortunate because it's like, you know, you're either going to come clean a hundred percent or you're not. And I'm, I appreciate the, the extent at yeah. which he has been upfront and honest, that sort of thing. But he needs to be that across the, the board here. And he's starting to make kind of like, I don't know, a little bit of a spin on what's happening. Well, I mean, it also too, if you're, if you're, if your QA team is that bad, they need to go and be replaced. Well, and they're not is, and I, I, we'll, we'll talk more about it. Cause he, I'm sure he's going to talk more here, but, um, yeah, there's, <laughs> yeah, there's more to it. While not perfect, it's a version of cyberpunk. We are very proud of at the same time, we're fighting for quality on all gen consoles till the very last moment. And every extra day of us working on the day zero update brought visible improvement. This is why we started sending console review keys on the 8th of December, which was later than we originally planned. This all happened while working from home with all the challenges resulting from the COVID-related restrictions. A lot of the dynamics we normally take for granted got lost over video calls or email, and we took that hit too. Now I'd like to tell you about our plans for the future and present a path for Cyberpunk 2077 on consoles and PC. We have already released three hotfixes improving the game, but that's just the beginning. Our ultimate goal is to fix the bugs and crashes gamers are experiencing across platforms. Please expect bigger and smaller patches on a regular basis. The first update will be dropping within 10 days and it will be followed by another, more significant one in the following weeks. We will, of course, continue to work on the game in future updates and improvements beyond that. Our big plans for supporting Cyberpunk in the long term did not change. As for the free DLCs, our initial plan was to deliver them just after the release, much like we did with The Witcher 3. We decided to focus on the most important fixes and updates first, and we'll be releasing the DLCs afterwards. Expect more information in the upcoming months. For those of you playing on next-gen consoles in back compatibility, you can still expect the free next-gen update for Xbox Series consoles and PlayStation 5 arriving in 2021. We are aiming at the second half of the year. I'd like to end this video by assuring you that we treat this entire situation very seriously and are working hard to make it right. The guiding principles of our company are still core to what we do. We still want to make amazing games and have an open communication with you, our players. For now, our immediate focus is to work hard on making sure you enjoy Cyberpunk 2077 regardless of platform. Beyond Cyberpunk, we have many plans for the future, which we'll share more about when we're ready. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. So he uh, transitioned from apologizing, and explaining what happened to talking about the roadmap into the future. Um, watching his face, I mean, you can tell like the, the guy is going through a lot just because um, the the gaming community, it's, it, it, it's very interesting how the gaming community works. And we've talked about this here and there on the show uh, at different times, but 
the gaming community um, is hyperbolic on both ends of the spectrum in the sense that if you've done them wrong or if you've done them dirty, so, so to speak, um, they are very, um, very angry. They can, they can be uh, very, um, uh, they, they can exhibit a lot of animosity toward a developer. And oftentimes that type of response is warranted because of some of the shenanigans. And sometimes those shenanigans that some publishers or developers uh, wield are pretty messed up. I mean, you, whether it's false advertising or it's abuse when it comes to microtransactions or you know whatever the case may be, you see that. Now, having said that, on the other end of the, of the spectrum, if you have a developer that does right by the gaming community, they are lavished with praise and with loyalty and any kind of DLC or, or say, you know, some sort of microtransaction that is deemed fair, people will buy it. They will buy it up. And I think in this type of situation, um, if you recall when we were giving like our favorite games of 2020, I selected the PC version of Cyberpunk 2777 as my favorite game of 2020. But I started off talking about that as how this game has a tale of two stories. One is the PC version and one is the console version. And the two are very different in terms of the gameplay experience. So... Did you have any thoughts on, on uh, like before we, we get into the roadmap of what's going on, did you have any thoughts about what he had to say? Yeah. Um, well, this third little bit here. So he's saying that the next gen update is basically going to happen in the second half of the year. Correct. Which is like July or later. Yep. And so... I was hoping it would be at least like the spring at the latest. And as of right now, I mean, after hearing that, I think, well, why am I, why do I own the game if it's not hardly playable? I can play the game, but after a while, it gives me a headache because it runs so poor. And so I have to like, I have to, at the cost for me is, okay, I'll play it for a little bit, but I have to stop because I don't want a headache. I can play Crash, I can play Final Fantasy, I can play Red Dead, I can play GTA, whatever I want to and not have those same headaches. But playing this game gives me a headache because of how excessively poor it runs. And so then I think, well, I mean, I don't want to return the game, but why would I pay top dollar for it right now when I can't even hardly play it? I don't even have an Xbox Series X. I might as well wait till I have a Series X, wait till the game is complete and bug free and then repurchase the game and I can play it the way it was meant to be played and the way it was sold to me as it would play. So and that, I mean, to me, that's a uh, pretty disheartening and the game is not going to be good for me personally, since I have the base system, the game is not going to be good until the latter half of the year. That's a long time to wait for a hotly anticipated title. Yeah. And I think it's important to note that when it comes to the actual upgrade for next gen consoles, he's not referring to the PS4 and Xbox one. He's referring to the Xbox series X and the right. PS5. So in your situation, it actually bodes better for you because the actual patches that are coming out are going to help your situation faster than they will in terms of taking advantage of the hardware because the upgrade itself He's referring to how like the game that I'm playing on Xbox Series X is actually a backwards compatible version of the Xbox One title. It's not taking advantage of the hardware the Xbox Series X or the PS5 have. That is what's going to come later in the year. So the actual patches, in fact, the, uh, the patch 1.1 got released today as of this recording that fixes a lot of things, uh, which we can segue into actually. So we, he, he mentioned that they had hot fixes 1.04, 1.05, and 1.06 that um, all got released in December shortly after the game was released, which was good. It was good to see them working feverishly on it, and rightfully so because their reputation is on the line. Like they, They've really got to make this right as quickly as possible. Patch 1.1 is uh, scheduled for January, which, as I just said, it, it, it got... Um, dropped today. And then they also have a 1.2 patch, which is, I believe is scheduled for sometime in February, if I'm not mistaken. He also talked about how there are multiple updates and improvements that are planned throughout 2021. 
Um, but I want to focus for a moment on today's patch. So it's available for PC consoles and Google Stadia. Um, and what exactly is included with this patch? There's memory usage improvements in various systems within the game. Uh, it should improve characters, interactions, navigation, in-game videos, such as like the news and the TV uh, screens that you see in the, in the world, etc. Foliage, laser effects, minimap, devices, the AI, street traffic, environmental damage, GPU related, and more. There have also been various crash fixes related to, among others, loading, saves, game opening and closing, uh, and, the, and the point of no return. Many fixes for quests in the open world are now detailed, which you can see below. Uh, let's see what else they have here. Those on the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One are experiencing the most issues in Cyberpunk 2077, and Patch 1.1 looks to fix crash issues on PS4 and improved memory usage for character creation, mirrors, scanning, camera remote control, menus, inventory, the map, and others on Xbox One, Xbox One X, and Xbox One S. Now, to get more into the nitty gritty of this, when it comes to stability, there are various stability improvements for the base consoles that include memory usage improvements in various systems like I just talked about, uh, various crash fixes. In terms of the quests and open world, they fixed an issue uh, that calls... Oh, this is actually the issue that I think Nick was talking about. Remember the Delamain quest, uh, the taxi right. AI yeah. thing. If you recall, he was frustrated because he couldn't finish out that quest. Well, here it says that uh, the 1.1 patch, it fixes an issue where calls from Delamain would end immediately and seem like they cannot be picked up. Uh, they also fixed an issue where players would not receive calls from Delamain when approaching relevant vehicles in that side quest. They fixed an issue uh, where the objective could get stuck on um, answer the call from Mr. Hands um, in that particular quest. I don't, and I'm, I'm intentionally not listing the the names of the quests because I just don't want people to to understand that in terms of uh, you know avoiding spoilers. Uh, fixed an issue where Judy could teleport underground. Uh, in, a, in a particular uh, mission, fixed an issue where it could be impossible to talk to the Zen Master, fixed an issue where uh, Takamura wouldn't call, um, fixed an issue where Jackie could would disappear in, in a particular mission, fixed an issue where it could be impossible to get out of the car. Um, there, there, There's actually quite a few of those. I, I won't, I'll, I'll skip some of these because it's actually a pretty long list. Um, as far as UI is concerned, a uh, fixed an issue where a uh, prompt for exiting brain dance could be missing, removed an invalid item from the loot, fixed an issue where a grenade's trajectory could be displayed in photo mode. Uh, yeah, the, the, again, a lot. There's stuff that are fixed with achievements, uh, miscellaneous stuff. Now, in your case, Xbox specific. Again, they, they reiterated they've improved the memory usage for character creation, mirrors, scanning, camera, remote control, menus, inventory, map, uh, etc. So there, there's actually quite a bit in this patch. And I'm going to look forward to seeing what you think. Like what, when, you, when you talk to me and uh, let me know um, what the gaming experience is like after the 1.1 patch. I'll let you know, Russ. Indeed, Steve. What were you going to say? Nothing. I was waiting for you. Oh. So with having all that said, um, I do think it's important to commend CD Projekt Red for being so aggressive in actually trying to right this wrong. You know, it's very easy to like dogpile on them and say, well, you know, this game's broken and there's all stuff needs to be fixed and stuff like that. The main difference is, is that if you look at other companies like EA or Activision or Ubisoft, um, they have released games that have had lots of issues in the past and they haven't really made a whole lot of changes to right those wrongs. They kind of make a lot of excuses and say, oh, it's supposed to be that way or basically deal with it. And I'm glad to see that CD Projekt Red is being very upfront and being very aggressive in trying to, to actually make this right. And I, I think at the end of the day, it's, it's, man, 
there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. You know, I have a feeling the the dev team knew that the game wasn't ready yet. And I think in terms of, of the, um, um, the bean counters, the investors, I think that they were applying a lot of pressure on CD Projekt Red to get this game out when the next gen consoles launched. I think that this game probably could have spent at least another year in development. And, it, you know, it, we're, we're, we are, are outsiders looking in. We don't understand all of it, but I, I mean, I'm, I'm speculating and guessing that's probably the case. Yeah. I think deadlines are, I mean, you, you need deadlines cause you need to kind of, you know, keep your people moving and focused and dedicated. Um, I think everybody has a passion to do it, but I think at some point the, you know, you need uh, some return on your investment you're, you you're, you're paying everybody to, to work up this game and it's been in process for a long time. You've been talking about it. People want to buy it. And the other end of the spectrum is that the people who are investing in you may or may not know everything about games and the time it takes to develop and the bugs you run into. All they want is a return on their investment because exactly. right? they're funding you. They're like, okay, when's the game going to go? Let's go, let's go, let's go. So I think as the leader, he has to kind of play both sides where he he knows what's going on with the dev team. He has folks dumping millions of bucks and they're a publicly traded company. Too. Exactly. Yes, they are. And so he has a lot of people to please, not just with his, his own team, but outside folks as well. And, um, I mean, was it the right call to release the game? No, but you know, I think there's a lot we don't know. I think he's just doing damage control at this point. I mean, I, I think it's a great that he's, that they've been doing so much to acknowledge um, the gamers and the gamers voice and people's concerns. And uh, I mean, yeah, it, you know, a lot, there's, there's been games. I mean, Anthem comes to mind where <laughs> we were sold like this great game and the game it's fine, but it's still, I mean, there's not really a community around Anthem really anymore. I mean, it's... I still see people playing it, but yeah, there, there's not nearly no, like a, no. as much of a community that's involved in playing the game. And that that um, is a, an interesting comparison because there are certain similarities in the sense that like if you look at the foundation of what Anthem is, the combat mechanics are really good in Anthem. The setup of Anthem is really good. Like... like it's amazing to me. It's like you, you have this skeleton system uh, of a foundation and to my knowledge, there really hasn't been any kind of aggressive push to like, to like add the, the, the flesh to it, the muscles and the tendons and everything else, which is unfortunate because I, you know, I actually um, popped into that game briefly last week. I forgot there, there's a lot to like about that game. It's just unfinished. It right. is a halfway finished game. Right. But if you remember back then, uh, the leadership, I mean, I don't think they pointed the finger at the development team, but the development team was basically saying, yeah, they put ex extraordinary pressure on us. Yeah. <clears throat> There's a lot of folks who left. You because had an EA big wig who come in and yeah. exerted a lot of unnecessary pressure. Yeah, and, and there was, I mean, there, there, things were terrible. And no one came out and said, yeah, that's actually our fault or this is these teams fault or, you know, no one kind of fell on the sword and in, in, of sorts, I guess. And so everyone was kind of pointing the finger and then the gamers were just left with an unfinished game. Well, and there were lots of bugs with Anthem too, if you recall, right. in terms of like, you know, the, the huge loading times on, of the, course. on the loading screens and the game would crash. Right. Uh, there was quite a bit and, and they have fixed some of those things. I don't want to make it sound like they didn't do anything. Right. Because they have. But I will say, I think in, in CD Projekt Red's case, they have been attacking these things quite a bit. Even after those hot fixes came out, I noticed um, both on, on Xbox Series X as well as the PC. I was like, oh, wow, yeah, this is playing a lot more stable than it was upon the first day one launch. So I'm, I'm confident that, that they will be able to tackle what they've got going on. Um, I want to pivot to talking about the DLC. So they have been talking about how they have a lot of DLC planned that is free. It's not going to be costing anything more. And apparently, according to their roadmap, they are probably going to start dropping DLC around May or June of 2021. And at least according to the, uh, the infographic that they released, it looks as though it's going to be constant. Like they, they're, it's not going to be just, Oh, here's one drop, but like, it's going to be this continuous dropping of DLC 
that will go through the second half of 2021 and into 2022. That makes me happy and excited because as someone who's already dumped over 300 hours of play into this game, I've already beaten the game once. I can tell you that I definitely want there to be more content. I would love to see a continuation of character stories as well as the introduction of new stories. I think it'd be fantastic to be able to continue fleshing out night city. Um, you know, one of the rumors I've seen on Reddit that would be really, really cool. I think it's a fabulous idea is the idea of having a subway structure within night city where you get introduced to perhaps other types of gang factions and stuff that, that live underground. That would be really, really cool. Um, the idea that night city itself is a terrific sandbox. It's a, it, they've done a wonderful job of, of building the foundation of how you interact and how you live within this world. Um, and I think that, that now it would be fantastic to be able to start looking into making more and more of those buildings accessible and start to flesh out, you know, how these different places look on the inside. Cause you can go into certain buildings and that's really cool. I love that. But I mean, an idea that went into my head is imagine being able to walk into any one of those buildings and have certain types of side quests, certain gigs, parts of the main story, introduction to new characters, that sort of thing. That would be exciting. That would be really, really cool. So we'll have to see how that works out. And just to reiterate, the next gen console update will probably be, if I had to guess, it's probably not going to drop until fourth quarter of 2021. <laughs> if I'm being real with myself, it's probably going to be the end of the year because they're going to be focusing so much on trying to squash these bugs. And from the looks of it, it looks like that, that they're, you know, again, we haven't tried as of this recording the 1.1 patch yet. Um, but the fact that they have 1.2 also right around the corner as well, I think that it's also hopefully going to help with all this stuff. I do believe, though, once you are able to get a next gen um, system, that is going to immediately see you're, you're going to see a night and day difference in terms of performance and quality and that sort of thing, even with it being backwards compatible. So, I'm hoping that with your birthday being right around the corner, maybe you can score yourself a next-gen console there, Steve. Mm, I don't know, Russ. I don't know. I think the wife's got something planned. Well, hopefully it's a system in there somewhere. Uh, somewhere at some time in the, this year, Russ, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> this year. <laughs> Did you have any uh, concluding thoughts on this whole situation there, Steve? Uh, one can only hope for the best, Russ. Do you have uh, lost confidence in CD Projekt Red or not? Um, I would say not at this time. I don't think I have lost confidence in them. I think I think they really are trying to do right. I think there's just a, a ton of stuff that we don't know that's behind the scenes that, um, that kind of came into play. I, I think they could have handled it much, much better than they did. I and mean, that's kind of... We, we've we've talked that to death, and I still feel the same way now. I mean, there's stuff that he's saying that he's doing damage control, and you know that that's there's something to be said for that. But there's a lot that's also not being said. So, at the end of the day, we just want a game that runs great, that gives us a wonderful experience, and um, <laughs> we just want it sooner than later. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I, I think that CD Projekt Red um, will do right by by its gaming community. I think that they have realized what a big mistake this is and um, some of the fallout that can happen and will remain there um, in terms of like a, a tarnished reputation if they don't make things right. I think they will. I have confidence in their ability and their their desire to want to to make it the best it can be because this has been their baby. I think that's one of the things that I walk away with is it's it's kind of like a trending thing right now to kind of dog pile and 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 uh, really run them through the ringer and some of that is deserved. I'm gonna I'm gonna be up front and say, hey, you know, <laughs> you guys released a game that was not ready to be released yet, and you know what what did you expect would happen? Honestly, you know you you've been hyping this game. This game was good to go. Like you could have easily, and I really do believe this. You they could have delayed that game for another year it would still sell like hotcakes. It would still sell amazingly well because everybody was on board to play this game. So there's that to be, you know, considered and that sort of thing. But, but having said that, 
I absolutely love Cyberpunk 2077. I think that they were so successful in how they approached combining an RPG with a first person shooter with a racing game. Is it perfect? No, there's all kinds of areas to improve on everything else. However, I don't want to take away from what is there, dude, there is so much to this game. It is legit. It is seriously a fantastic game and it's, it's a wonderful achievement that they've been able to, to, get across. My hope is though, is that they're able to have this vision fully realized. And quite honestly, I hope that they have a wealth of DLC plan, not just for 2021. I honestly hope that they have a continuation almost like on like an episodic basis where they're able to, to support this title going into the, the next like three to four years. I mean, honestly, when I think of GTA online, Rockstar has done a fantastic job of supporting that component to their game. And GTA five came out, I think back in like 2012, 2013, somewhere around there. And they've still supported it to this day. So my hope is that they will do the same when it comes to cyberpunk. That wraps up this episode of joy guys. And make sure you tune in next week. Thanks for hanging out with us. If you enjoyed this episode, we invite you to check out patreon.com slash joy which is spelled J O Y G A S M and consider becoming a monthly contributor. You'll get exclusive perks and early access to the show. Not to mention it really helps us continue doing what we love to do. Also, you can follow us on social media and YouTube. Just do a search for joy TV. Last but not least, Search for Joygasm TV on Twitch to see us stream our gaming adventures live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Central Time. We will see you all next week. <laughs> <laughs>